you know, evidence-based medicine is how we connect research to clinical practice. And evidence-based medicine started in the 80s and 90s uh, as a way of looking at uh, how studies are done and how that can be applied to clinical care. And it's gone through a number of different um, changes over the multiple years. Uh, a number of different uh, groups have embraced it and uh, have helped kind of guide it as its own area uh, of a kind of specific area of science. And so evidence-based medicine now is being applied to you know, thousands of different conditions. Uh, and now I think we're looking at evidence-based medicine to see it, is it accurate, is it being used correctly, um, are people or groups or stakeholders using it um, inappropriately in some cases. And, and so the focus for today is to really talk about evidence-based medicine and try to educate physicians about what it actually is and then go over some examples of maybe where evidence-based medicine uh, has been used uh, for certain people's advantages and maybe impacting uh, patient care in the wrong way. Well, it's, it's uh, evidence-based medicine. Clinical trials are a part of evidence-based medicine. Uh, and so again, I think the easiest way to conceptualize it is clinical research, which can be done in a multiple different ways. Uh, how is evidence-based medicine um, it uses clinical uh, research uh, and then uh, looks at studies and then looks at how that research can be applied to patient care and then it also looks at how do you study the outcomes related to those. I think pr uh, primary care should know that uh, again evidence-based medicine is very complex and it, many times the term gets thrown around and so they need to understand the basic components of it so they can judge clinical studies when they come out or even guidelines and maybe have an understanding of um, was there bias involved, uh, how were the studies done, uh, which studies did they look at, really just to give, make them better kind of users of um, clinical information and research information. I, th I think the CDC um, guidelines were, for opioid prescribing were definitely a, uh, an example and I think tested um, different aspects of evidence-based medicine. Uh, because they were done by a governmental body, it was different from the usual practice where evidence-based medicine guidelines are written by scientific groups or associations. So the, uh, the setup was a little differently. Uh, uh, the CDC has a different uh, mission, and the mission is to help uh, protect the public. And so really the CDC guidelines were primarily done to decrease opioid abuse and uh, heroin overdoses and, and misuse of medications. So there was some controversy because it was, the mission was really uh, to limit abuse, but then it turned into um, a guideline. And so I think that's where there's some trepidation from some of the uh, physician groups and provider groups that some of the recommendations may have not been solely evidence-based medicine, but more opinion um, or contextual evidence as we describe it. Well, I think for, uh, in general, the, the 12 recommendations um, are, are very useful for physicians and providers and how they assess patients, how they monitor patients, um, how they treat patients that develop other problems related to opioid use. Uh, I think some of the, the problems within it were um, uh, some of the evidence that they used um, was graded very low. Uh, and th there's a problem when the evidence is very low and recommendations are made. Um, some of those recommendations, some of the um, details about the recommendations, some of the pain community and, and providers maybe won't agree with um, and or it may just create um, a fear for pre pre prescribers which could lead to undertreatment of pain. So it's really more, the, in general the guidelines are good, um, but if they're misused or misinterpreted, uh, patients could be impacted in a negative way and I think many times patients could be stigmatized uh, in denied care that they, they could benefit from. In the state of Washington, um, the uh, state uh, public health um, had a decision about uh, epidural injections and they uh, looked at evidence-based medicine to support a procedure that many of us use and think it's valuable for patients. Um, and I think that was a good example this past year. On, on They looked at the evidence in, in somewhat of an older fashion uh, and um, it took a kind of a grassroots effort from a number of different societies and groups in the state. Um, at a hearing 
to kind of defend the evidence uh, and question their recommendations. Uh, and the end point of that actually was that the state decided to continue to approve epidural injections. But I think it was a good exercise in kind of questioning um, how they reviewed the evidence, even though it was a very comprehensive review. Um, there were some problems with the specifics of that, and that was brought to light by the, sci the scientific and the pain community, um, and I think they made the right decision. So it's more of a good example of there's evidence-based medicine, but then you really have to have a real deep understanding of, of what it actually says. I think for primary care, uh, just talking about evidence-based medicine, we, we're, we're given evidence in many different ways, whether it be journals, articles, uh, recommendations from different groups, and I think sometimes primary care may feel overwhelmed, uh, but I think a lot of times you have to just stop and you know, read through the literature, read through the guideline yourself, and just have a better understanding of, of what's actually in the guideline uh, versus maybe a, uh, a one or two sentence uh, description. Uh, because I think many times the guidelines are written f for the right intent, uh, but they're just used the wrong way. So I think physicians and clinicians on their own should take the time to review those and, and make their own opinions.